Welcome to all participants of this event. Um, this is a European Central Bank Youth Dialogue. This is year 2020 in Cologne. So unfortunately not live, but in an online format. And it's a great honor for us here in Cologne to welcome you, uh, Mr. De Guindos, um, from the ECB, you're the vice president of the ECB. So that's a great event for us to have you here. So first I would like to welcome all other participants and in specific, specifically the students, of course, because this is an event which is dedicated specifically to young people and the students here in Cologne specific, specifically, where we have the chance to ask um, Mr. Degin those questions and to discuss with him issues related to the ECB. So I will not talk too much, but let me brief mention at the beginning uh, that this meeting is jointly organized uh, with the ECB, the Institute of Economic Policy, and uh, the Cluster of Excellence it contribute. The Institute of Economic Policy is a research institute here in Cologne, founded in 1950, and it's dedicated to research on economic policy solutions and the institutions. And uh, it contributes, the other co-organizer, uh, and this is what I'm specifically proud of, uh, it's a joint research project organized by the University of Cologne in Bonn, and it's funded by the German Excellent Initiative, uh, and it's an excellence cluster, um, and it's the only one in economics. So uh, maybe Mr. De Guindos, you know uh, that your current colleague, Isabel Schnabel, was okay. previously also spokesperson of mm -hmm. a contribute. Uh, so that's unfortunate for us that sh she left uh, the University of Bonn, but of course, uh, she is perfectly in place at the ECB, I think. So um, let me now come briefly to uh, the main person for today. Uh, this is Mr. De Guindos. He, as I mentioned, he's vice president of the ECB, but I think even more important for us, he is an outstanding expert in financial market issues. So he is director at the ECB, responsible also for the areas of risk management, uh, macroprudential regulation, and financial stability. And I think that this issue, financial stability, is something which, from my perspective at least for today, might lead to the most interesting parts of the discussions, uh, because in these exceptional times, I think financial stability also faces exceptional threats. But now I would like to hand over to Mr. De Guindos. Well, first of all, good afternoon. It's my pleasure huh, to be, be here uh, you know, with you. And despite the fact that we cannot make it uh, physically, but uh, I hope that uh, next time, uh, you know, we will be able to, to, to do it in person. It will be a very good sign that we have defeated uh, uh, the, the pandemic. No? And I am totally sure that, uh, you know, next time we will be able to do it, uh, you know, in person. That uh, I think that human touch is always important. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Schabert, for the, for the introduction. Uh, I can give you perhaps, you know, some... Uh, some thoughts about the, the financial stability landscape now in the in the in the euro area and i think that uh, the first uh, uh, thing that we have to take into consideration is that you know this is not uh, let's say a traditional shock a traditional crisis this crisis has been produced by an external factor a exogenous factor that is uh, you know, a pandemic something that uh, was totally unprecedented and unexpected it gave rise to a very important uh, drop in, in gdp very intense and very concentrated, uh, and it was related to the to the, the containment measures uh, that uh, were taken by the different governments. And once uh, you know the governments started to open up the economy, you know the recovery started to to to, to take place. So, in terms of financial stability, and this is uh, you know a difference with what happened in, in 2010, 20, 2012, you know this has not been produced by the by the by the financial sector. Um, uh, you know, the financial tightening was the consequence of the pandemic and the important drop in activity that gave rise to a big decline in the revenues of corporates. Corporates, uh, because of the lockdown, found that perhaps, you know, the revenues started to drop by 20, 30, 40 percent. So that was, uh, you know, a big difference with respect with what happened in previous, in previous crises. It was not only the intensity, it was the origin. The origin was not a, a tightening of uh, monetary policy uh, uh, implemented by the central banks, 
uh, it was not uh, you know a financial crisis it was an external external factor so uh, you know the situation of the banks that is uh, you know the main part of the of the financial system in Europe was quite different to the one that we had in in 2008 the level of, the level of capital was much higher uh, the level of liquidity was much, was much better. You know, a lot of measures were, were taken in order to try to, to make the banks much more resilient. And uh, simultaneously, there were also, you know, some problems before, before the pandemic, before Corona. And the main problem of the, of the banking system in Europe was the very low profitability situation. Mm -hmm. uh, this low profitability situation, uh, you know, is something that has given rise to very low valuations in markets. If you compare, for instance, you know, the price to book huh, of the European banks in comparison with other jurisdictions, for instance, the US, you will realize that the price to book here, you know, in, in Europe is much, much, much lower. And uh, uh, this is, this is a, a source of concern. And simultaneously, the pandemic is having an impact uh, in terms of activity, in terms of the evolution of non-performing loans that is going to aggravate this low profitability situation. So... Uh, uh, it's not going to be, you know, let's say, you know, uh, a solvency crisis. It's going to be, you know, a profitability crisis. Profitability is the key element, and the, in, in our view, the main uh, uh, source of concern now with respect to the financial stability situation in the eurozone. Thank you, Jose. Um, Maybe I should describe briefly what are the possibilities today within this discussion or this meeting. So, of course, we are happy then that you ask questions, um, just raise your hand. So that's a function that you can activate. Um, I, I suppose that you are familiar with that. So uh, that's a possibility that I can see who is willing to, uh, to ask questions. Uh, and, and then you can, of course, be activated and then it uh, would be nice if you unmute yourself so that we can understand you, of course, and also that um, we can see you. Please um, activate also your video. That would be great. Um, if, before we get to the open discussion, I would say, uh, we thought about, uh, we addressed maybe some question at the beginning, uh, Mr. De Guinness and myself, um, more or less maybe also to set the stage or to address already very urgent questions or things that, uh, I think that are very apparent. Um, so we discussed before that maybe today it's possible to have at least three topics that we can address, but it might also be that in the end, we just focus on the overall overwhelming question on how the pandemic uh, affects our life and financial markets. So, but, but this is open up to you. So you're just deciding on what we are dis discussing in the end. So essentially that's, um, you are the director more or less of uh, this meeting here. Okay, so we have some uh, possibilities also at the end of the meeting that you can comment on this sort of um, meeting, so this format in particular, or you can also, you can give feedback to the ECB in terms of improvements or changes to this format, but this is something uh, which will, you will be asked again at the end of the meeting. So I already mentioned this, that in any case, uh, please stay tuned until the end. So that would be important. Um, and then I, if, it, if it's okay, so I would like to start directly uh, with a question which I think all of us are concerned about. So the question, this pandemic, so you already described this in the opening words, Mr. De Guindos, but. Um, what are, from your point of view, the biggest threats at the moment? So what, from the perspective also from the ECB, is the biggest threat coming to the financial markets or banks induced by the pandemic? So and where in these stages of the transmission of this non-financial shock, at which st stages you might think is the ECB most helpful? Well, I think that the response of the of the of the ECB and uh, you know the response of monetary policy and as well you know the, the response of the fiscal authorities has been quite different to the one that we had um, 10, 12 years ago. I think that is it has been much more intense and much more rapid. If you look at uh, you know the kind of measures that we have taken, uh, you know they differ. They are quite different to the ones that uh, you know were were pursued uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago. So. Uh, 
I think that uh, you know this is something that I think that is quite quite positive. I said before that this is an unprecedented shock, huh? uh, but this is an unprecedented shock in terms of uh, you know the origin of the shock that is a pandemic, as uh, everybody knows, but as well as in terms of the intensity and in terms of the of how rapid you know the the the, the, the pandemic has produced uh, you know a decline in GDP, a decline in income for uh, you know the, the the eurozone and for the um, worldwide uh, so uh, the first line of defense uh, for sure that is fiscal policy fiscal policy uh, uh, you know that well you know you know perfectly that all the the governments have taken very important measures in order to try to tell and to address uh, you know the impact of the of the of the pandemic but there is something that is quite obvious that i would like to stress is that uh, despite the, the, the fact that the shock is common, the consequences of the, of the shock are not, uh, are not uh, totally symmetric uh, across the, the countries and across sectors. Uh, the impact on, on services is much more intense. And, uh, you know, in, in, whereas in manufacturing, uh, you know, the impact is much more, much more reduced. And taking into consideration that, uh, you know, countries have different fiscal space and that, uh, you know, the, the structure of the economy of the different countries of the euro area is not identical at all, huh? then we have seen that there is, you know, uh, disparities in terms of economic performance. Uh, some countries are, do, are doing better and some, uh, uh, some uh, you know, are lagging behind. So it's very important that, uh, you know, fiscal policy uh, responds to this situation. But not all the countries have the, fit, the same or identical fiscal space. That's another difficulty to do that. We had countries with uh, public debt ratios that were in the area of 60, 70 percent, whereas in other cases were above 100 percent. And, uh, you know, the fiscal deficits were not identical at all. So, you know, the, the rapidity and the, and, the, and the intensity of the, of the, of the, of the response, uh, you know, was not identical, uh, you know, across the different, the different countries. That's why the recovery fund that was approved by uh, the, the European Council is becoming so important. It's becoming so so important not only because it's going to you know we're going to have common 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 joint debt issued by 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 the European Commission, or we are going to have uh, you know a very big package, is because uh, you know this uh, this fund can be allocated the resources can be allocated to the countries that have, are suffering more. So uh, with respect to fiscal policy, uh, I think that uh, you know these are elements that we have to take in consideration. Uh, rapid response. Uh, the first line of defense and the, the importance of the pan-European package, let's call it that, uh, that, uh, that way, uh, in order to show simultaneously that, uh, you know, there is uh, the willingness of the European institutions to respond to this, uh, you know, unprecedented situation. With respect to monetary policy, in terms of the different uh, measures that we have taken, I think that, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have had a three-pillar approach to the crisis. The first one has been, you know, to, to, to grant and to inject liquidity to the European banks in very good conditions uh, through, you know, uh, the, our long-term refinancing operations, what we call the Telfos. This is something that, uh, you know, is to, to deliver, you know, that uh, uh, to deliver uh, 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 liquidity to the European banks. The second one is our purchase program. We created and uh, we, we laid out huh, uh, a very sp specific uh, program in order to deal with the crisis, that is what we call the, 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 our pandemic uh, 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 program, that uh, started with 750, was increased by 600 afterwards, and last week was, uh, you know, the envelope was additionally increased by 500 billion euro. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in order to, to to try to maintain, you know, financing conditions in the in the markets. And the third one was uh, were you know the measures taken by the macroprudential authorities in order to to try to relieve capital to the banks in order to uh, uh, give the banks leeway to continue you know lending to the economy to the real economy to households and to and to corporates. So altogether, when you see you know the the the, 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 the measures taken by the ECB, what you can realize is that uh, you know we have avoided fragmentation in the main uh, fixed income market that is the sovereign debt market. And this has avoided, you know, fragmentation in other fixed income and, uh, you know, credit markets. And I think that to maintain, you know, these financing conditions and the controls has been has been key, because we had uh, 
uh, you know, a, a health, uh, you know, a, a shock that gave rise to an economic crisis. And, uh, you know, we tried to avoid that on top of that, we've had, uh, you know, to, to have, you know, a debt crisis. So that was the main intention of our, of our actions. Simultaneously, I think that, uh, you know, as I have said before, fiscal policies are key. Uh, fiscal policies that, uh, you know, were very similar all over Europe uh, in terms of the, of the actions taken. For instance, uh, you know, for log schemes, part-time schemes that, uh, you know, have been, uh, you know, quite relevant and, uh, you know, intensively used all over uh, 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 the European countries. And the second one has been the public guarantee schemes. Public guarantee schemes, that, uh, you know, is a good combination with the liquidity that we have injected with the banks in order to continue maintaining the flow of credit uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the economy alive and to avoid a credit, a credit, a credit crunch. So, I would say that with full respect of the independence of the of the ECB, uh, well, you know, I think that the combination of fiscal and monetary stimuli this time has been quite different. And, uh, you know, um, despite the fact that this crisis has, uh, you know, an intensity that is really unprecedented, uh, well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the instruments that we have used, that we have put in place, both from the fiscal side and from the monetary side, I think that have uh, really reduced the intensity of the shock that otherwise would have been you know much more much more uh, you know uh, deep uh, and uh, intense uh, for the european citizens thank you very much for these explanations so and of course we we try from as an outsider to understand and fully capture the different measures of the ecb um, but it's one thing to read just about it or to see it in the data or also to describe in your words uh, what are the uh, goals and what are the, the channels by which one accepts these measures work. So that's, of course, very interesting. Um, so I was asked for this format to, to discuss with you around 20 minutes and uh, then we go through several topics. But I think this topic might be so urgent in, in, at the moment. Maybe we'll open the floor now for the students uh, to ask some questions, but I, because I, th I can think that these issues related to the pandemic and what is happening at the moment might be the one that, which are most apparent and most salient at the moment. So if, if there are any questions, please raise your hands. Then I can see it on the list of participants. Yes, Mr. Tobias Herbst, maybe you start. Yeah, thanks a lot. And, and thanks a lot for the very interesting introduction. Um, so you already mentioned that uh, you at the ECB, you uh, kind of lowered macroprudential, macroprudential buffers to, to release capital. Um, and I'm wondering, so my understanding was that macroprudential policy was in the first place, like set in, in place to deal with crises that um, emerge in the banking system or in the financial system and to do kind of with the credit cycle. Now this crisis, as you said, is not in the credit, it emerged not in the credit market, but still you release these buffers. Um, and now if another credit crisis or financial crisis was to hit, we had to not have any buffers left, right? Um, so I'm wondering whether macroprudential policy kind of is, is kind of dead now after this crisis or whether you expect the buffers to be, to be raised or um, tightened again after the crisis shortly or what's your, your view on that? Well, you're totally right that, you know, this crisis is different because of the speed and because of the intensity. And, uh, you know, it's not uh, the typical, the typical, you know, uh, let's say business cycle or financial cycle, you know, because normally the business cycle, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a different shape than uh, this, 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 this one. So this is something that we have to bear in mind. Uh, and even for our models, and this is something that is relevant to capture the nature of this crisis is something that is not easy. Because, well, uh, you know, we, we, we are not used to dealing with pandemics of this size, with uh, the impacts that uh, the impact that, uh, you know, this pandemic uh, is having now. So that's the first, uh, the first point. But uh, as you have uh, correctly mentioned, you know, the main, uh, let's say, uh, uh, goal of, uh, you know, macroprudential policy is to try to, to build up buffers in good times in order to, uh, you know, relieve these buffers when you know the the, the, the situation uh, becomes you know more difficult, and when the, when the downswing uh, of the business cycle starts, so that's the main the main principle in order to try to minimize and to uh, you know to avoid any sort of amplification hmm, 
of you know the credit cycle uh, and the impact of this uh, you know amplification of the credit cycle into into the the, 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 the the economy. In this case, well, the reaction was very rapid. You know, the macroprudential the macroprudential authorities you know immediately released uh, you know the, the the what we call the countercyclical buffer, the CCYB, uh, immediately. And not only that, even uh, supervisors, so micro uh, uh, authorities, also, you know, tried to to to, to release um, uh, capital in order to maintain the flow the flow the flow of credit. And the main idea was to try to avoid a credit a credit crunch. There is something that you know I would like to stress that I think that is important. You know, because I referred before that uh, you know the capital situation of the European banks was much better than uh, you know the one that we had uh, you know 10, 12 years ago before you know the, the previous financial crisis. But uh, you know, low profitability, uh, you know, is also a threat for 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 you know uh, you know or uh, you know trying to maintain the flow the flow of credit because if your profitability is very very low. Uh, you have difficulties to tap markets because your valuations are going to be as well, you know, very, very low. And so, you know, the dilution of shareholders is huge. And simultaneously, if you are, you know, if you are not a very profitable bank, you are going to have the difficulties to generate uh, capital intern internally, organically. So uh, uh, capital becomes, you know, a very scarce resource. That's why you know we are continuously you know monitoring that banks use the, the, the capital in the correct way. That's why, for instance, you know we we, we had in place you know some uh, suspension of the of dividend payments, hmm? and that's why you know we have a new guideline uh, that was approved yesterday by the supervisory board, in order to uh, say that well you know if you are going to distribute dividends, uh, this, uh, this 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 should be you know very prudent. And you know, uh, respecting you know some concrete thresholds. So, why? Because we want to use, hmm, we want the banks using the the, the the capital in order to maintain the credit flow. That was uh, you know the the, the 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 intention. But on the other side, you have that uh, you know capital is a scarce resource; it's very expensive. And so, from the uh, let's say, from the standpoint of the of the of the banks. Uh, you know they will try to 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 minimize the potential the potential use uh, of the of the capital buffers that we have we have released and this is one of the things that we are continuously uh, you know uh, monitoring you have made a good point you know what's going to happen you know in the near future well in the near future what we try to do is to to give uh, the banks uh, you know perspective and forward guidance we say that well we will have to to, to rebuild you know the capital buffers but we will have to do it you know, over time, that uh, because otherwise they would not use the capital, the capital buffers that we have released now. So that uh, you know, the replenishment uh, of the of the of the capital buffers will take uh, will 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 be, uh, you know, will take place, you know, gradually over time, and that uh, you know, banks will not have to to, to rebuild these buffers, and so that uh, the potential reluctance to use the buffers now, uh, you know, is overcome. So. This is the kind and the kind of approach that we are doing with macroprudential and microprudential supervisory uh, measures. But I think that at the end of the day, you know, the, the goal is always, uh, you know, the same. The goal is to, to try to keep the flow of credit alive. Because I referred before, to, you know, to the financial tightening of the uh, European corporates because of the of the pandemic, and so what we have to do is to try to 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 deliver credit and to grant credit to these companies in order to cross the, the river uh, and you know to go to the other side of the of the of the river that uh, you know for sure that will be reached uh, once uh, you know the pandemic is over. Yeah, thanks for the first question and the answer. Of course, uh, I have some other hands raised here, so uh, I would like to uh, ask Mrs. Faust, Ms. Faust, to. If you raise your hand, maybe to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, um, and we can see you. Yeah, very good. Hello. Uh, my question is, um, what's your opinion on potential debt cuts um, for old debt um, of uh, European countries? Thank you. Well, I want to, to be extremely clear with respect to that. Now, first of all, uh, you know, I refer that you, you, I think that you refer to the, to the issue of the debt cancellation. Uh, you know, for sovereigns, well, that cancellation is uh, first of all is illegal according to the to the to the to the treaty, and so you know it could not be possible. It could be considered you know monetary financing, and so uh, I think that 
you know, is something that uh, from uh, the legal standpoint is out of the question. But secondly, I think that, uh, you know, I would like to go as well to the question of the rationale, hmm? the economic rationale. It, it, you know, debt cancellation doesn't make any sense now. Hmm? Doesn't make any sense uh, because what we are trying to do is to maintain financing conditions, uh, you know, at very favorable levels. And uh, I think that uh, the cancellation uh, could have, you know, different, uh, different, uh, you know, an impact that could undermine, you know, uh, all the system that we have, we have, we have in place. I think that uh, you know uh, to to pay back, huh, you know, uh, debts is is key in order to maintain confidence, uh, and you know because you cannot uh, because if you you start in a sort of uh, you know dialogue with respect to restructuring the debt, I think that uh, you know at the end of the day that what you can do is to impair the future issuance of uh, of, of 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 debt because confidence is going to be undermined, is going to be damaged, so. Uh, you know, to be, uh, you know, to, to summarize from a legal standpoint, debt cancellation, that debt forgiveness is not possible. And secondly, even from the financial or economic rationale, I think that it could be a big mistake huh? uh, just even, you know, to, to pose these kind of questions because at the end of the day, what you are doing is, doing is undermining the confidence in the whole, in the whole system. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, Prof Professor Sabert, referred at the beginning about you know the long term consequences of the of the of the crisis and i think that one of the the consequences that we are going to have that is uh, totally unavoidable is that the debt, public debt ratio of uh, some countries of all the countries is going to to, to increase is going to to, to go up uh, but uh, that's the consequence of having you know fiscal policy as the main line of defense there is no alternative to, to, to fiscal policy and to an, inc an increase in fiscal deficits and to an increase in public debt ratios. But once, you know, the pandemic uh, fades, uh, when the, once the pandemic uh, is, 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 is over, I think that, uh, you know, different governments, the different governments will have to pay attention to fiscal sustainability. Uh, we are going to have an environment of very low interest rates that I think that is going to be, you know, helping hand in order to, to guarantee, you know, the sustainability of the of the of the of the of the public debt. But for sure that immediately, you know, when the pandemic is over, you know, fiscal deficits will have to go down. Uh, we hope that we will recover, uh, you know, growth in in the different countries, and so public debt ratios will have to to decline mm -hmm. and to, to go back to to levels that are fully compatible with, uh, uh, you know, uh, fiscal sustainability over the medium term. Yes, thank you, Mr. Faust. Um, so I have a long list now, meanwhile, from uh, for questions. So I think the next one uh, would be Mr. Tuft, Niklas Tuft. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, I've got a question. Um, you raised the, or you, you said before that, that fiscal policy is sort of the, the, the first line of defense against this pandemic. So um, at least for Germany, the state has uh, provided a, a lot of liquidity to businesses and has, has even changed the bankruptcy rules um, for some time. So my question is, uh, are you expecting more instability from that front once those measures run out? So, so maybe is the, is the true monetary shock of the uh, pandemic sort of delayed and still to come? That would be my question. I think that this is a good point because, uh, you know, you're referring about the phasing out of the of the different measures, uh, how, you know, this, uh, you know, the speed of the phasing out, how you are going to withdraw the fiscal measures could affect, uh, you know, the evolution of the economy. And I think that you, you, you need to have, you know, let's say a very balanced approach. On the one hand, what you need to, to, to if you withdraw very rapidly, you know, the for long schemes, or the public guarantee schemes, uh, you are running the risk that uh, you know you will you will enter into a sort of cliff edge effect that uh, you will you that you will you will uh, stop uh, you know the the, the 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 recovery. On the other hand, if uh, you know the measures are uh, you know in place for a long period of time, you can give rise to let's say some issues of moral hazard. And zombification of the of the European economy, so I think that is very important to do it in parallel, to do it uh, you know uh, at the correct pace. Um, I think that uh, you know I would err huh? uh, 
if I if I were you know a, a person with uh, responsibilities on the fiscal side, on the side of uh, you know maintaining uh, uh, you know these measures a little bit longer, because uh, I think that the main risk that we can run if you withdraw very rapidly you know the measures that you have put in place is that uh, you can stop the, the the recovery and to have uh, you know a, a, a new dip in economic activity that could be strongly detrimental. So. It could be very prudent, but simultaneously, you cannot uh, uh, have you know these measures in place forever, because otherwise, what you are going to give rise is to moral hazard situation and uh, you know to problems in terms of zombification. I think that uh, if you allow me to say, I think that we have to try to avoid zombie companies, and what we have to try to help is what uh, I would call uh, you know sleeping beauties, uh, companies that are viable hmm, and that we know that are suffering because of the pandemic, but once the pandemic is over, they will be viable again. I think that is not easy, uh, it's not simple, uh, but I think that we should try to, to have, you know, a quite balanced approach with respect to that. Yes, thank you. So um, I think I asked Florian Dicknick, uh, who also raised his hand. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, we were talking about macro prudential regulation and you said that it's very important to keep the flow of credit alive and that the drawing down of liquidity buffers for banks was actually quite helpful. Um, so my question is, we, we, we in like until April, we saw a huge outflow from investment funds, so from non-banks, um, which do intermediate also a fair share of credit in, in the European um, area here. And um, then the question is, I mean, it was prevented, um, the outflows by a, a huge buying program of the ECB, yet uh, going forward, this is a risk that still is there. So are there any plans to address this in the future? Well, you're totally right. I think that, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, in Europe, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, too much focused on banks hmm? because the European economy, uh, as everybody knows, is much more bank-based than uh, the US economy, for instance. But uh, if you look at the evolution of the numbers, mainly over the last decade, what you can see is that now, you know, the volume of assets under management in the non-bank industry, uh, you know, is even higher than uh, the volume of the balance sheet of the, you know, the aggregate level and uh, the aggregate volume of, uh, of the balance sheet of the, of the European, the European banks. And you are totally right that, uh, you know, they are playing a very important role in funding the economy. In concrete, very concrete sectors, no, but uh, you know they are now you know an important source of funding. Uh, well, banks are regulated entities, strictly supervised. Uh, well, you have the SSM, you have uh, you know supervisors everywhere. Uh, regulation with respect to to, to 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 liquidity, to solvency, uh, to corporate governance, a lot of things, no, a lot of regulations uh, with respect to to, to to banks, no. But simultaneously, in the case of the non-banks, the situation is a little bit, uh, is a little bit, uh, is a little bit different. They are not as supervised as uh, you know the, 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 the banks, and uh, you know they do not have any sort of macroprudential policy in place. So, we had uh, you know difficult moments in March, in terms of outflows of uh, you know some some investment funds. Hmm? Uh, you know, in a moment of turbulence in the marketplace, remember, you know, the situation at the end of, uh, you know, at the end of uh, February, the beginning of March, until until April. Well, the level of outflows was very, very, very relevant in not only in the states but as well, you know, in 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 in, in, in Europe. And one of the segments that uh, was uh, uh, hardest hit was the money market fund industry. Theoretically, you know, money market funds are very close to, to cash. You know, it's an alternative to, to deposit, uh, you know, cash in a in a in a bank. Uh, and we we saw some uh, you know some problems there because uh, you know outflows were huge because there was a sort of uh, let's say search for a cash uh, movement, uh, dash for cash. Uh, you know, in 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 March, and it affected you know the money the money market funds. So uh, uh, here we realized, even in the case of the money market funds, that they have to invest in a very, in very short term and very liquid assets. You know, there was the potential of a mismatch or a disconnection between redemptions 
um, uh, you know, the, the 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 disposal of the of the of the assets in a moment of turbulence, in a moment of turmoil. So, I think that uh, now at the international level, and I think that this is relevant at the level of the FSB, hmm, the Financial Stability Board, uh, that is, uh, you know, let's say a global, uh, you know, uh, regulator, regulator, you know, uh, uh, I would say a, a global forum. Uh, you know, for analyzing, you know, potential uh, financial risks, we have started to work in order to have in place macroprudential policies for 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 mutual funds. Uh, this is going to be a big change. Eh? This is going to be a big change. Uh, mm, uh, but for instance, you know, uh, to have uh, let's say ex ante macroprudential measures. To force, you know, uh, you know, the the the, the, the investment funds, the, the, the mutual funds, to keep a certain percentage of their portfolios in very liquid assets, just to meet, you know, the redemptions that they could have. Well, these kind of things, uh, I think that now is are are, are evolving, because uh, as you have said before, you know, they are they are becoming even more relevant than the traditional banks, and simultaneously, simultaneously, in terms of the funding of the economy. Uh, well, uh, you know, they are playing a role and they are extremely interconnected with the rest of the financial system. So uh, if you have a problem, you know, in a, in a fund, in a relevant fund uh, of liquidity, uh, you know, I think that uh, we have to bear in mind the possibility that, uh, you know, these problems immediately will spread huh, to the rest of the financial, the financial, the financial system. That's why, uh, you know, to have a, a macroprudential toolkit, huh, for investment funds is so important. And I think that is high in the agenda of uh, you know the, the the global regulators. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, uh, I think, by uh, Nicolas Ego. Yes. So uh, thank you for this nice event. And um, yeah, I have a question, actually, a follow-up question uh, on on what you just uh, referred to. So uh, before the crisis, the ECB already ran um, yeah, the stress test or so-called stress test for banks in order to yeah, model uh, different uh, crisis scenarios. So now uh, the corona crisis hit. Um, and the first question uh, was the corona crisis now actually more severe than the um, before modeled um, scenarios? And uh, if yes, um, how fast can the banks now be sufficiently capitalized? And also, if yes, um, how, yeah, let's say suitable is this whole tool of uh, stress tests if in the end, um, yeah, they are not, let's say, uh, hard enough for the reality to come? Well, you're asking about uh, the stress testing that I think that is uh, one of the, of the you know, main instruments uh, at the disposal of uh, supervisors and regulators now. Uh, you are totally right that uh, uh, that uh, you know the corona the corona crisis is uh, you know is very different in terms of intensity and in terms of how rapid uh, you know has taken place and has has uh, you know unfolded so uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, well uh, if uh, we we had been told one year ago that uh, we could have you know a crisis as the one that we are having now for sure that uh, you know everybody could be you know quite skeptical now because this was totally unprecedented. Always you have in life, you know, and mainly in financial system, in financial issues, you have uh, you have unknowns. Huh? But I think that an unknown of this, uh, you know, of this caliber, uh, you know, it was I think that uh, you know uh, unthinkable. Hmm? But it has taken place, you know, just to give you. So, uh, you know, the, the the brain principle of the stress testing is that uh, you try to analyze how reluctant. How 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 resilient? Excuse me, the banks are, uh, you know, uh, confronting the banks with uh, you know a very 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 rush, very 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 difficult, very severe scenario. Uh, the one that we had, uh, you know, in March because of the pandemic, I think that uh, you know it was totally unprecedented. But uh, you know what you have there, you know, is a very important decline in GDP. You have an impact on the on the price of real estate. You have uh, simultaneously, uh, you know, it's always that we're considering now the possibility of, uh, you know, a very uh, low interest rate environment 
for a long period of time because you, you know that this is not this is uh, you know something that is relevant for the for the for the monks and afterwards you calculate you know the, the how 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 much capital banks are going to to deplete how much they are going to lose hmm? we did that in june we, it was not the traditional stress uh, stress test exercise it was uh, you know what we call the vulnerability analysis because in the case of the stress test you have two different approaches you know the bottom up that is the usual one that's the one that we are going to carry out in 2021 and the ones that you have uh, you have uh, seen in the past, you have uh, you have had in the past, uh, that is bottom up. Hmm? You uh, give the scenario to the banks, and you see bank by bank uh, the impact that uh, you know this very severe scenario is having on the PLs and the, and the balance sheet uh, and the solvency of the banks. That's uh, you know something that is let's say very granular. Huh? Uh, you know, very detailed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, stress test. That's the typical one. But in June. What we did is what we call, you know, uh, uh, a vulnerability analysis. It was top down. Hmm? We take our models that we have in the CV. We introduce the shock that was uh, uh, very, very severe, more severe than the, the, the severe scenarios of the traditional stress test. And we tried to find out, you know, the potential outcome in terms of capital depletion for the banks. And perhaps, you know, there were several several conclusions no uh, the first one is that uh, uh, you know in the baseline scenario that is very similar to the one that we are having now and that we are projecting well the capital depletion would not be uh, you know very 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 high that uh, banks could perfectly withstand huh, you know the impact of this pandemic always according to the models huh, right before but you know the in the very severe scenario that uh, you know the main difference with the baseline scenario was that the recovery was much 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 less intense huh? and it took longer to go back to the pre pre corona uh, gdp levels in that case you know capital depletion was important was was relevant was in the area if i remember correctly in the area of 400 basis points uh, always if you allow me to say and this is something that sometimes we we overlook in, in 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 finance and in economics, uh, you know the problem is not as much you know the average impact, but the dispersion of the impact. The standard deviation matters, in my view, as much as you know the the the, 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 the average dispersion is very 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 important, and the problem was not that well you know the impact was 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 big in, in both cases. But the question is that not all the banks are identical. Not all the banks have the same uh, business model. So, uh, you know, you could have, you know, banks that, uh, you know, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, the average in terms of capital depletion, depletion was 100 basis points. That is something that they can, they can, they can, uh, you know, resist and they can withstand perfectly because the, the average capital ratio was above 14 percent. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was the average. Then you have some, you know, let's say I would say outliers uh, with lower capital 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 basis um, that uh, you know could suffer, and uh, you know if some banks, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the of the issues uh, that uh, you know is very important in terms of supervision is that you have to try to avoid the perception that the whole system is damaged hmm, because some of some pieces of the of the system are suffering so uh, but to summarize uh, you know uh, now with the vulnerability analysis that we have that what took into consideration a very 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 uh, tough uh, scenario even much tougher than the the one that was used in the stress test of uh, 2019 uh, capital you know on average the european banks were able uh, you know to 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 confront and to face up to the to the to the, to the corona crisis and you know the main element to take into consideration it was the, the, the issue of dispersion that not all the banks are in an identical position and afterwards if you know the recovery you know is delayed is postponed then that could have you know an, an incremental impact on terms of the impact on the solvency of the banks yeah thank you um so we already had a lot of questions which go deep into details of financial market issues and stability. 
Of course, we can continue, but um, I also hope that we, at least maybe in the next part, we can also address issues which are more, say, at the heart of uh, monetary policy discussions on, say, price stability and so on. But uh, nevertheless, I have a list still of questions. I think um, we have to go through in any case. Um, the next one is by um, Fabian Oeschläger. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it might be a little bit of an older topic, but I would uh, like to know what is your opinion about the European Commission vetoing the merging of big banks in Europe? I'm thinking especially about the uh, recent uh, decline merging of Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank. And if you would think that the creation of national champions through mergers and acquisition would make the bank sector more resilient and profitable? Well, as you can imagine, I'm not going to enter into any sort of concrete, uh, of concrete deal. Um, but uh, if you allow me, I would elaborate, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, starting for one issue that uh, you know I stressed and I highlighted at the beginning of my 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 intervention, that is the low profitability situation of the European banks. Uh, why that's uh, that's important? That's important because. If uh, you have low profitability, you're going to have low valuations and you're going to have difficulties to raise uh, capital in the markets and to generate capital internally, organically. Hmm? So uh, what are the reasons behind this uh, low profitability? For instance, to give you, an, uh, you know, some numbers. No? Uh, before Corona, the return on equity of uh, you know, the European banks, on average, always on average, and there, there, there was dispersion, as you can imagine, was in the area of four or five percent. And the, uh, the, the cost of capital uh, required uh, or demanded by institutional investors in the banking industry was close to 10. So when you have uh, a business that produces a return on equity of four or five and your investors uh, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, are asking for something close to 10%, you know, the way out immediately is to have, you know, a price to book that is clearly below one, that you have an important discount with respect to the book value of the, of the, of the European banks. So uh, uh, that's to give you, you know, uh, the reason behind, you know, the low, the, low, the low valuations. You have a big gap between the return that you can obtain on average and the capital and the cost of equity that uh, you know the, 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 the institutional investors are demanding to the to the industry. So, having said that, uh, what what's the reason this very low profitability of the European banks? Um, I think that there are structural factors. There are you know the cost extra, structure of the banks. There are uh, you know a situation of clear very clear excess capacity of the banks. Uh, you have also, you know, the potential, the potential, uh, let's say, uh, uh, competition coming or rivalry coming from fintech or the big techs hmm, that are going to be there. So that uh, retail banking is going to be a very difficult, a very difficult business over the next, uh, over the next years. So uh, you can do several things. Hmm? Uh, the first one that you can, that you should do, is to try to reduce your cost structure, to invest in digitalization. Hmm? And to try to become competitive that uh, that way, and to try to increase your your, your profitability, your return on, on equity. And one avenue in order to do that is, you know, to have consolidation, to have a merger. Hmm? Because when you have a merger, what you can do is to start. You know, you, you are going to have you know uh, uh, economies of scale, economies of scope, and you can reduce you know the cost structure. Of the new of the of the new of the new entity, so consolidation is not let's say it's not a goal in itself. It's an avenue in order to try to reduce you know the excess capacity, the excessive cost uh, structure, the excessive um, cost uh, uh, to income ratio of the European the European the European banks. Uh, it could be ideal to have cross border consolidation. We are we are not seeing cross border consolidation. We are only seeing you know, uh, domestic consolidation. In the case of Spain, in the case of Italy, uh, you have some, some, some transactions and some deals, some mergers, uh, you know, now in the pipeline. But, uh, well, uh, this is something that we have to think about. Why, do we, do we, we don't have, why don't we have 
uh, cross-border consolidation in Europe. I think that it has to do with, uh, you know, the completion of the banking union. It has to do with some specific and particular, you know, uh, uh, regulations in concrete countries and difficulties to, to capture, you know, these economies of scale, these economies of scope. Uh, but, uh, you know, the message, I repeat, is, uh, you know, low profitability of the European banks. They need to act rapidly to correct hmm, that situation because it can give rise to problems. For instance, if you have very low profitability, uh, you, you, a bank always will have the tendency to under provision. And, uh, you know, that could give rise if you have, you are going to have, you know, a flow uh, of non-performing loans then, uh, you know, the credibility of your balance sheet will be, will be incurred. So uh, 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 these are the, 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 the issues that uh, we have to address at the European, the European level. I think that uh, to complete banking unions could be key. And I think that, uh, you know, because, well, theoretically, we have a single supervisor, we have a single monetary policy, we have a single resolution entity in Europe. But, uh, you know, we don't have a real uh, uh, banking uh, 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 industry. Uh, you know, with a European scale in that sense. We have a lot of domestic banks, and I think that uh, this is something that, uh, you know, should be, should, should be addressed in the near future. Okay, thank you. So um, the next question, I think, is from uh, Fabian Knapp. Hello. Um... My question is related to um, the default rate of bank loans to corporates or firms. Um, don't you think that when the longer lockdowns in several countries at the moment last and fiscal stimulus is phased out slowly, don't you think that well, there will be one point in time where there's a big increase in the default rate because uh, all the defaults in the last month have been delayed? Well, this is a, you know, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, I referred before, you know, in terms of how you are going to graduate uh, and calibrate the phasing out of uh, of your of your of your measures. There is something that is quite obvious, you know, this, uh, despite all the measures that we have taken, this is a very big crisis, and big crises have impact. We have, uh, you know, reduced the impact of the crisis, but we have not avoided the impact of the crisis. Uh, so that's obvious when you you, you are going to 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 to, to uh, you know the, for instance to recover you know the the the, the pre corona or gdp level uh, you will need something between in the area of two years hmm? uh, so you have lost uh, two, two two years and you have you are going to have uh, structural scars i referred before to the public debt ratio but also to the corporate to the corporate leverage uh, to the corporate debt ratio so uh, mm, uh, this is going to be a, a reality, and that's why you know non-performing loans will be on the rise over the next uh, I don't know you know over the next year. Hmm? We we have calculated that uh, you know in the worst case scenario, you can have you know an increase in, in non-performing loans that was close to 1.4 trillion euro. So uh, the crisis is going to be to be to be to be to be there. So what you have to do in order to deal with uh, you know that situation is first of all to, to make you know uh, uh, the banks uh, much more much more resilient and there is something that is quite uh, quite quite obvious if we avoid a credit crunch and this is something that uh, so far you know we have uh, we have uh, we have avoided then you know uh, viable companies that were viable before you know corona will continue being viable in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the future you have to focus the efforts, as, as I said before, you know, on those companies that uh, you know uh, are viable. That uh, what I I I I I I called you know the sleeping beauties that will be able to you know to to come back again once the pandemic when the pandemic uh, is over. But anyhow, we are going to have uh, you know a drop in number from uh, a decline, uh, uh, an increase in the non-performing loan situation. That's for for sure. That's why, you know, to, to have, you know, the banks much better capitalized than in the past is something that is, uh, that is relevant. But uh, the impact is going to be, is going to be, is going to be there, no? Because this crisis has been, has had, uh, you know, an intensity that uh, it was totally unprecedented in comparison with the past. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question is sent from uh, Toby Arbogast. Yes. 
Um, and I apologize up front for throwing around with some technical jargon. I just want to avoid getting a, a textbook answer or, or something that I can find on the website. Um, I've worked at the Bundesbank myself, so I, I know some of these um, answers. Um, my, my question relates to the, the neutrality of monetary policy, especially in, uh, in the background of the new program, PEP, etc. And I, I'm referring here specific, specifically to these, the studies showing on hysteresis effects or the permanent effects of financial crisis, Claudio Borio, even the IMF, you know, issuing this mea culpa on, on fiscal austerity. So there's a lot of um, evidence also that um, distributional matters, um, wealth inequality, etc., they don't matter only in the, sh in the short run where supposedly monetary policy is responsible, but they also have an impact on the long run where so far the consensus is this is not the realm of monetary policy. The central bank just minimizes the loss function, inflation targeting price stability. But now we know that there's a lot of problems coming from empirical studies and also theoretical work where the natural rate of interest or unemployment, the output gap, they're all unob unobservable, but they're quite important for re retaining this neutrality. My question is this, is there any rethinking of the neutrality of monetary policy in the long run? And I'm referring not to inflation, the, the um, negative effects of inflation, I'm referring to a broader non-neutrality. And if it's still retained, what's the basis of sticking to that? Is it really still the old Lucas rational choice theory <laughs> of long run neutrality of money and hence also monetary policy? Well, this is a very, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, theoretical question, but a very good question. I think that is the core of, uh, of uh, you know, monetary policy implementation over the next years, you know. Well, uh, here, uh, I think that, uh, you know, you're referring to the question of the neutrality of money over time. Hmm? Uh, I can give you my personal, my personal impression. It's, uh, you know, it's my personal, my personal view. I think that, uh, you know, money and monetary policy in the long term only affect nominal variables, not real variable, variables. So real variables, in my view, are determined by other factors. You know, how competitive your markets are, uh, how effective is your, let's say, your, uh, you know, institutional framework, uh, how your labor market works, uh, education all these kind of things no i think that in the in the in the in the long term they determine you know uh, you know what is it could be you know the the, the growth in the medium and long term you know growth potential uh, that at the end of the day is going to be determined by productivity productivity is going to be the factor that is going to 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 be uh, you know translated into potential growth in the medium in the in the medium in the medium term what i think that is important is that uh, you know in the in the in the meantime until we reach you know the the, the long term uh, uh, monetary policy has real consequences and it has real consequences in terms of uh, you know the impact uh, you know on uh, on credit mainly mm -hmm. so you have the business cycle you have the credit cycle you have uh, you know both cycles that uh, you know uh, live together and you have, what you have to try to do is that uh, you know the the credit cycle does not amplify you know the the, the swings that you are going to have in the business cycle, mm -hmm. and that's the the intention of uh, of monetary policy. In that respect, for instance, macro potential is, is quite uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite relevant in order to try to tame and to uh, you know to smooth uh, the evolution of the of the credit cycle in order to minimize the potential impact on the on the business on the business cycle. Having said that. You have to bear in mind that if you look at the, the European Treaty, you will see that uh, you know our mandate is price stability. Um, but I think that is, is quite uh, is quite 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 uh, quite important, no? Uh, um, and uh, you know the definition of price stability that we have now is uh, you know below but close to two percent huh? because you need that definition huh? in order to 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 do to do to do that no so uh, we have to be focused on that but simultaneously when we take our decisions in terms of monetary policy uh, 
with the main focus on press stability, we are also considering other kinds of, uh, of potential reverberations of our, or, or impacts of our, of our policies. For instance, financial stability. For instance, uh, you know, uh, if uh, you know the impact on the on the on the on the, on the business 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 cycle, the the, the, the impact on, on 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 activity, we based our decision on two pillars. The first one is the monetary pillar, that is you know the evolution of credit, the evolution of uh, you know uh, the amount of money, uh, the quantity of money, and the second pillar is the evolution of the of the of the of the economy. No? So to respond to your question, uh, that I think that is something that is well, it's going to be part, this is going to be the core of our strategy review that we have uh, undertaken and that we expect to, to finalize uh, next year. Um, I would say that uh, we will continue, you know, our main goal is price stability. We are continuously looking our inflation, our inflation projections over time in order to take our decisions, but simultaneously, we have to bear in mind that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, this is not only going to affect, you know, price stability, it's going to affect other, other variables. And I think that question of, uh, you know, equality is something that is quite relevant. I think that this is going to be part of the political debate that we are going to have. Um, if you want my opinion, well, uh, because monetary policy you know, it's a blunt policy in the sense that uh, you cannot fine tune the, 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 the policy. Uh, in that respect, I think that uh, the question of equality has to be addressed much more with fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, you can target, you know, much more. You can go to the concrete, uh, you know, situations that you, you deem that are not, uh, you know, the correct ones. Uh, you can spend much more on education. You can spend much more on research. You can spend much more, let's say, even in climate change, in the fight against climate change. Um, and, you know, simultaneously, you have the taxation and taxation. Well, you know, you have uh, you, they have to produce the correct incentives in the, in the economy. But simultaneously, you can reduce, you know, the, the, the potential, you know, gaps in terms of, uh, you know, of, uh, of uh, wealth, in terms of income among the different uh, the, the, the societies. No? So uh, we can make our contribution, but, uh, you know, our contribution is not going to be, you know, as uh, critical, as concrete, as particular as as in the case of the fiscal, the fiscal, the fiscal, the fiscal policy, there is another debate eh? uh, going to 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 equalities. Whether you know, with our QE, we are uh, you know uh, increasing the price of assets, and so uh, you know assets are are owned eh? by affluent people, whereas uh, you know, well, I think that uh, you know in that debate uh, you have to take into consideration that our monetary policy you know, has been, you know, one of the main drivers of the recovery. And the recovery gave, gave rise to, 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 to employment. And employment, uh, you know, is a very, you know, I would say it's the main driver of uh, the end of the day of, uh, you know, in order to, to reduce uh, and to fill the gaps in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, differences of, 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 uh, of income and differences of, 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 of wealth. So, uh, mm, uh, uh, this debate is going to be to be there. It's something that I do not, I, I, I don't ignore. I think that is something that we should uh, we should take into consideration. But uh, you know, I think that we should have also you know a balanced uh, a balanced approach and to put both the pros and the cons of our actions. So for the, the fight against uh, you know inequality, I think that is the main is a role is the role of fiscal policy. And uh, simultaneously, you know, I think that in the case of monetary policy, it's not the correct instrument to do that, but we have to be aware of uh, you know the potential side effects that our policies might have. Yes, thank you very much for the question and the intense answer. So, um, the next question is by uh, Nick Tröster. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. De Gudos. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm also interested in how the ESB, uh, ECB deals with um, the fundamentals of theory, um, in particular with this um, upcoming modern monetary theory. Um, are there scientists that uh, consider this theory as realistic at the ECB, or do you um, stand all in line and say, oh, okay, that's not how the... Um, 
the financial system works and we should definitely not uh, rely on quantitative easing alone um, or are they maybe scientists that say uh, yeah we should um, do a lot more of quantitative easing and yeah that's going to be the future or how are how are the scientists at ECP thinking thank you well uh, first of all uh, you know what i have to say is that the modern monetary theory is not so modern uh, you know it's quite old you know it's uh, you know it's, uh, it's based on the principle that uh, you know a central bank of a country uh, can create money all the money that they want and uh, you know that you can use this money uh, you know to to finance public expenditure and uh, you know to, to avoid any sort of uh, of, uh, of uh, you know of limitation of the of the fiscal policy so uh, this has been there, you know, since uh, even even this, since the Middle Ages, uh, uh, because uh, you know you know perfectly that uh, you know uh, if you create too much too much money over time, sooner or later you will have you will you will have inflation. And as I have said before, uh, 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 you know the amount of money cannot create wealth, cannot create employment. In the long term, employment and activity and growth are determined by other variables, uh, determined by productivity. Uh, there is something that uh, you know is a, a phrase that I, I like to, to repeat: uh, monetary policy is not all mighty. We are not all powerful. We have not the philosopher's stone. Hmm? So. Uh, you can have an impact, you know, in the in the short term, in the medium term, uh, over the, the the variables. You can smooth, uh, you know, the, the 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 business the business cycle. But in the long term, uh, you know, our real variables, the ones that are going to determine to determine, you know, the the, the 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 potential growth of the economy, and at the end of the day, you know, the welfare of the population of a country. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's with respect to modern. But you know, you, you make a reference to QE that uh, I would like to perhaps you know letting aside the question of uh, you know the modern monetary theory, uh, I would like to elaborate and perhaps to clarify a little bit. Uh, the traditional implementation of monetary policy policy was hmm, that you determined you know in the short term you know the interest rates, the short term interest rate, so uh, you move up. Or down the short-term interest rate as a central bank, and immediately you have an impact on the term structure of the yield curve. You affect the whole yield curve. That was, uh, you know, the traditional way of, uh, you know, the implementation of the of uh, you know monetary policy, mm -hmm. the one that is uh, always described huh, in the in the economic theory uh, books. Uh, but uh, what's you know the issue? What What's the reason behind that? You know, central banks, all the central banks of the world, are moving away from this traditional, you know, uh, uh, approach uh, in terms of implementation of monetary policy and going much more to, let's say, to unconventional, huh? on an orthodox, uh, uh, you know, monetary monetary actions like QE that you have, quantitative easing that you have, you have, you have referred. I think that there is a factor behind that. I think that is very relevant. Is the the continuous decline over the last uh, two decades of the natural interest rate? The natural interest rate is a real variable; it's not a monetary variable. The real interest rate is that level of interest rate that uh, you know balances savings and investment and investment. And what we have seen over the last, uh, let's say, two decades more or less, is that this natural interest rate. Has, has been declining over time. Why? Uh, you know, globalization, I think that it has been quite uh, quite important. Demographics, uh, even technological progress, are reducing, you know, this natural interest rate. This natural interest rate, uh, you know, our calculations is that, uh, you know, two decades ago was around, uh, you know, 2%. It's not, uh, it's not an observable or visible magnitude, but, uh, you know, you can make some calculations in order to gauge, uh, you know, the level. And what we see now is that, you know, this natural interest rate is very close to zero. And, you know, the interest rates that you look at uh, and that uh, are visible are the nominal interest rates. So you, uh, on top of the uh, natural interest rate, you put your expectation, your inflation expectation. So 
if you had a natural interest rate of two percent and your uh, you know your projection of inflation is two two point five then you, what you will see is that nominal interest rates are in the area of four four five percent but if the natural interest rate is close to zero and your inflation expectations are very moderate then the nominal interest rate will be very 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 low and that's why you know that reduces the leeway of the traditional monetary policy uh, if that's the situation, uh, you know, uh, you will, you're going to hit the lower bound of, uh, you know, the, 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 the interest rates, that is the zero, the zero level, much more often than before. So in order to continue, you know, uh, uh, you know, implementing and executing and pursuing your monetary policy, you have to go to other instruments. And one of the instruments is the, the QE, is the purchase programs. Because with the purchase program, you can you can you can influence the whole uh, you know range uh, of the yield curve. Uh, so uh, I would like that uh, you know this uh, this is something that is difficult to understand because it's a big modification about the way that uh, monetary policy is implemented. In the past, when the real interest rate was much higher, it was quite easy. But now that uh, you know you are going to be very close to the lower bound much more often than before then you you need to go to other to other to other alternative instruments for instance negative interest rates in order to try you know to, to, to breach uh, the lower bound and QE or you know our asset purchases programs that's the reason the reason behind but the reason behind you know the new implementation of the monetary policy is you know uh, the the drop the decline the secular decline that we have seen of the natural interest rate yeah thank you um, so i think this is important uh, also to explain uh, not only here in this place but also maybe also in my lectures and somewhere else uh, differences between the approach that we typically view on um, how a central bank works with these instruments on the one hand side and what we have nowadays in the last 10 years have seen uh, with regard to asset purchase programs and when people sometimes shortcut this analysis and talk about modern monetary theory uh, which is uh, I would say not not very sophisticated way to, to be concerned with the mechanism and the instruments of the central bank but thanks a lot Mr. De Guindos, for that um, so we have a few more questions on the list. Even time is running up. Maybe we can take one more question. Sure, uh, can do it. Yeah, no, okay. no problem. Um, there's a question by Franz Lennart. Well, yes, we have talked already about um, the depth of the states, the new depth uh, due to Corona. And we've also talked about the, the zero percent interest. Uh, that's, well, for the moment. Um, and now my question would be, now that all Europe, or nearly all the European countries are crashing through their debt ceilings, does that mean that for the next decade, we will, uh, the 1% interest will have to stay in order to allow the states to lower the debt? Or are there other solutions that could avoid 0% interest? Well, I think that, uh, you know, as uh, I referred before, you know, there are, there are you know other 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 solutions uh, i said uh, you know fiscal is the first line of defense is that you know that the way to, you have to act immediately take into consideration you know uh, you know the intensity of the crisis that we uh, we have we have suffered uh, this is going we are going to have a legacy the legacy is going to to be uh, much higher uh, public debt ratios hmm? and uh, you know with big disparities among among countries in the in the in the in the euro area so once the pandemic is over, uh, and if you have uh, used the fiscal policy correctly, uh, 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 the, you know you will you will you will you will reduce automatically your 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 fiscal deficit. You will have a recovery because be totally totally sure 
that once uh, you know the pandemic is over, once vaccination has given rise to, to herd uh, immunity, uh, uh, you know we will see you know an important recovery of activity. It's something that we saw, for instance, in the third quarter of the of this year. You know that uh, you know when the containment measures started to be raised immediately, you know, the, 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 the activity started to go up uh, so very, very, very rapidly. And, you know, the countries, they will find that, uh, you know, the fiscal deficits will reduce, that uh, the nominal GDP and real GDP will go up, huh? and, uh, but the public debt ratio will be, will, be, will, be, will, be, will be higher. So that's why, you know, the, the way to deal with this situation is, uh, uh, is uh, you know, to start to, 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 to reduce and uh, to start to, to, to trigger you know, a decline of the public debt, uh, of the public debt ratio uh, to come back to uh, fiscal sustainability, sustainability issues. There is a question of, uh, let's say, time consistency. In the short term, fiscal has to, to be focused on the pandemic and the consequences of the pandemic. You should not try to use you know, this situation in order to foster or to increase uh, structural deficits that uh, you know, is always a temptation that politicians have. Uh, so uh, we focus on health, for log schemes, public guarantees, um, you know, the, 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 the real, the real uh, you know, instruments to, to, to deal with the, with the pandemic. Once the pandemic starts to fade away, you know, those expenditures will start to be reduced. You will have a recovery. And finally, eventually you will find that you have a higher public debt ratio. And in that moment of time, you know, uh, you know uh, fiscal sustainability will come to the fore and will be part of the public debate. Yeah, thank you. So, Mr. Degindos, uh, I see two further questions. So, is it okay for you if we go? No ahead? problem. You know, I Great. am very, very happy to, to, to talk to you. Hmm? Thanks a lot. So, the, the next question is by Jonas Czarnik. Yeah, so. I want to touch a, a topic we haven't emphasized that much, which is uh, climate change. So you said that the central bank is not almighty, but um, I have the feeling that policymakers at the ECB believe that it's less suited to address climate change than, than, than governments. Why, why do you believe so? And then why does, does this not undermine the credibility of the central bank? Well, this is our, as well, you know, a good, a good question and climate change is something that is quite relevant. It's going to be, you know, there and, our, you know, present in our daily lives. And I think that, uh, you know, the fight against climate change uh, you know, is going to be, well, now is one of the main policies of the European, the European Union. Well, let me say something, you know, first of all, you know, the, 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 the main institutions to deal with climate change um, have to be the governments. The main and the most powerful instrument to reduce, you know, uh, carbon emissions is to have a tax on carbon emissions. That's, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we are not regulators, we are central bankers, no? So the government have, uh, you know, a real, a real, the real responsibility to deal with, uh, you know, the reduction of carbon emissions. And I think that the, the main instrument to do that is uh, you know through taxation. Hmm? That's very clear. But uh, simultaneously, and perhaps you know this is the point uh, that uh, you know I would like to make. Uh, climate change, uh, you know, is going to be part of the work of any central bank. First of all, because uh, there is you know we are responsible for financial stability, and uh, 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 climate change is having an impact on financial stability. If you look at the balance sheet of the banks. Hmm, uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, you see that uh, there are exposures to, uh, to, 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 to corporates that are going to be affected by the transition to a green economy. And this is something that we have to take into consideration. That's the first point. Second point, because climate change is, is going to have, you know, an impact on the outlook. It's going to have an impact on inflation. It's going to have an impact on growth. Um, even, you know, uh, if you impose a tax on, on carbon emissions and you do what you have to do, this is going to have an impact on inflation. But, uh, you know, and, uh, inflation, uh, as you know, price stability is our, our mandate. And finally, let me say something that uh, as well is very, very relevant for us. If climate change, if, uh, uh, climate change related uh, risks 
um, are going to, to affect the solvency of the different corporates. And we purchase, uh, you know, in our programs, we purchase, you know, securities issued by these corporates. It's very important that we take into consideration these climate change uh, related risks that can have, you know, an impact that can that can impair, that can damage, huh? you know, the solvency of these issues. Um, how are we going to deal with that? We are going to deal with that, you know, trying to to, to convince uh, uh, rating companies because we, what we use, but whenever we buy a security, a bond, uh, we look at the rating. You know that uh, you know we have to buy above, huh? uh, you know, uh, investment investment grade and that we cannot buy below investment grade. But I think that when you analyze the rating companies. We'll have to analyze, uh, you know, how, you know, the kind of change related risks affect the solvency of these companies. And that will be taken into consideration by us. So indirectly, uh, you know, climate change is entering into the way that we implement our monetary policy and our purchases. So there are different dimensions. You no, know? we are not the, the main actor. You know? The main actor uh, is going to be the banks. But simultaneously, I think that we can make a contribution. And I think that that contribution could be could be could be relevant in several in several aspects. I have referred to you in three concrete aspects, but I think that there are even 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 more. Yeah, thanks a lot. So there's one further question by Florian Herst. Yeah, hi. Um, you mentioned your main goal is price stability, and per definition, it's two percent inflation. Uh, do you think the crisis will change the goal? And don't you think it's controversial that you just change the goal and say it's and th say the price is still stable? I, I, in my head, it's kind of controversial. Well, our our mandate, as you have said, is price stability, and you have to 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 operationalize, you know, to define what the price stability is. Uh, in the in the history of the ECB, uh, we had to, we have had two definitions of price stability so far. The first one is below two percent. The second one, after two thousand and three, if I am right, if I remember uh, rightly, uh, is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, below but close to two percent. And now we have launched our strategy review process. The strategy review process, one of the issues that we are going to look at, is the definition of price stability. I would say that, uh, uh, well, uh, now uh, for sure that uh, if I, if well, you want my opinion, I think that uh, monetary policy is not about revolution, it's about devolution. Mm -hmm. So uh, 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 I think that our definition of price stability can be modified. It's something that the Governing Council will decide uh, before the end of the strategy review period. That is going to be, you know, mid uh, next year, or in, even in the third quarter of of, ne of next year. Uh, but it will not be, you know, it will not be a revolution with respect to what we have now. Uh, I think that's much more important than uh, the definition of price stability the instruments that we are going to use to deliver. Because so far, if you look at uh, the evolution of the inflation rate in Europe over the last uh, ten years. What you will see is that both in terms of headline and in terms of underlying inflation, where we are clearly below 2%. So there are aspects, there are other structural uh, you know, uh, frameworks that uh, have given rise to a reduction of the, of, the, of, the, of the inflation rate. The traditional Phillips curve uh, you know, models, they do not work as they used to, to, to work uh, 20 years ago in terms of the ter trying to determine you know, what's going to be you know, the, the inflation according to the, to the, mon the monetary and the fiscal stimuli, the stimuli that you have in place. But, uh, 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 well, the definition will be there. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a revolution with respect to the one that we have now. Uh, it will be an evolution. Uh, but I think that the big discussion of our strategy review is going to be about the instruments. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I think this was more or less a, a nice last question, which was more a big picture question. So because we went back to um, the main goal of the ECB with regard to price stability. So as far as I can see, I have I don't have any further question on the list. Um, so I think therefore, 
if, if there's no further question, then I would like, first of all, to thank you, uh, Mr. Gigindos. So it was a pleasure for us. It was great to learn so much about different aspects. In particular, in the beginning, we talked a lot of financial, about financial markets, so that was fantastic. So I think we have very valuable insights here from you with regard to ECB policy and also the overall picture regarding financial markets. And thanks, of course, also to all participants uh, for your questions and also for listening to the discussion. Um, I think it was really worthwhile to, to listen to all these explanations and questions and discussions. So that was great. Um, yes, thanks. You can see now, uh, I think it's from uh, Katrin or from Felix, uh, you posted now this, uh, this slide. I would like to ask all participants, um, it would be great if you can give, you, give us some feedback on this format and the discussion and the way we discuss these issues here uh, within this meeting. Uh, so please go to um, the link that you can see here on the slide uh, and please fill out the form. So that was, we, would be very nice so, to get some feedback from you. So other than that, I have to say it was for me a great pleasure I would love to have some similar format again in the future, hopefully not online, yeah? hopefully live, and maybe also then again at the University of Cologne. Um, and so today we essentially just talked about, so more or less 19% of the discussion was just on the pandemic. So maybe the next time, when time allows and you can come around again, so maybe we can address other issues which are also very important and relevant. Maybe later on, after we are through this pandemic, we are, would like to talk about other things. So, once again, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Yes, I wish you all so very nice uh, Christmas days and Happy New Year. Bye bye. Goodbye.